Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Massey, and I have one of my colleagues and friends, Dr. Sarah Gottfried, author, physician, um, wonderful person who's written so much on hormonal health and all aspects that I think relate to a better life. And I'm so glad to get to talk to you today. Uh, Dr. Masley, so happy to be with you and with our people today. Hooray. So I'm exploring what we can do for a better brain. And I'm, I'm wondering from your background as a physician and all the research and studies you've done, what do you, what do you feel we can do to enhance brain function and prevent memory loss? Well, I love this topic because... You know, you get to a certain age. Let's just say I turned 50 this year. <laughs> and you get a lot more interested in this topic, right? Um, so, well, you know, in functional medicine, the kind of medicine that I practice and you practice, I feel like the key is really to pay attention to the way that you eat, move, think, and supplement. And that's certainly true when it comes to creating a better brain. There's some other components that I think are also crucial. I'm sure they're in your new book. Hormones, you know, making sure you're getting the nutrients that are supportive. So that includes hormones as well as other common nutrient deficiencies that can impact your memory and your brain function. Um, inflammation, I feel like that is one of the most common root causes of why people have a decline in their brain function as they get older, starting around age 50. Toxins, I think, are a huge topic. I've just dived into the literature on toxins, and frankly, that can make your eyes glaze over. So maybe we can talk about that in a more playful way and like keep everybody awake on our conversation today. So those are some of the key things. I mean, I always start with food. I mean, you and I have had this conversation so many times. Food first. Like, we both have a food first philosophy. Well, and I like that because I think there's clearly foods. I mean, from my perspective, we have specific foods that help our brain and ones that hurt it. We have key nutrients we can't live without and our brain doesn't function without. So I love um, fitness. You said movement, I think, but I really, our data from our clinic, the biggest marker that looked at improving brain processing speed was how fit you are, not how many minutes you spend, but your fitness. Hmm. And then stress management, things like yoga, meditation. I know you're really big on these concepts of, you know, that inner peace and how that impacts our hormone levels. Um, that's pretty powerful. And our data is really showing that to be the case. And I, I do want to get to toxins because I think there's some really common toxins that are easy to avoid if you know what to do. So, I'm, yes, I absolutely will we'll get to that on this conversation here today. Well, and so it, and it how makes, much? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> how much can you think we can really prevent for memory loss? I mean, it's the in my patients, it's the scariest thing I ask them about. Number one. So how much do you, would you go out on a limb? What are you willing to go out on a limb and say we can prevent today? Well, you know, I've been practicing functional medicine for about 25 years, and I would say, mm -hmm. I would say you can prevent most of it. You know, if you're going to make me commit to a number, I would say somewhere around 90 to 95 percent. I'm not going to say 100 percent because we pretty much never mm -hmm. say that in medicine, yeah, um, as exactly. you know. But it's, you know, I think it's a lot of people think that getting older just means that you start to lose your marbles, you start to lose your memory, you know, your short term memory is not what it used to be first, and then maybe you lose some long term memory. And that is, that's not the case. It's not aging. It's these other factors that you just listed. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's these other factors that we really want to pay attention to. And I think when you address those factors, you make a decline in cognitive function optional. Well, and I, I got to apologize, putting you on the spot for a number, that was a tough one. But I, I got to say, I really love your answer, though, because I think just reversing insulin resistance by itself, we could get rid of 60% with just, current. That's, that's like activity and food choices, maybe nutrients. But if we did the whole program that you and I would really want our patients and followers to, to go through, 
I, I think we can get rid of 90%. I'm not, not going to say 100 because I, there's some genetic factors that are really complicated. We haven't figured. But, but if we could get rid of this 90% of the scariest disease, I think that would be awesome. So, uh, so I got to apologize. Sorry if you put it on the spot there. But, um, no, no, no. Uh, no, put me on the spot. I'm happy to be put on the spot. I like it when you okay. push me a little. You always do that. But, <laughs> but I, yeah, we're, we're right at the, I think, the same um, very much same page and what we could do. And that's really fantastic. And that should really be encouraging for people who are scared about this. Even Not everybody has memory loss. Some will just have a little brain fog or forgetful or they have to reread a passage in a book. Um, we all have those moments once in a while, but if they start hitting you regularly, I mean, it, it is concerning out there today. You yeah. had, you were going to say something before I asked you that question. Well, I would just add that, you know, don't wait until it's regular. <laughs> all it takes is a couple of times of walking into a room and thinking, okay, what, why did I walk in here? Or, you know, maybe you're, you're opening a new browser on your laptop and you're, you're wondering, okay, what was it I was going to search for again? Like, don't wait until you have this happening every day. I want people to act sooner. Like the, the sooner you address this, the better. And I think some of the early symptoms, we can maybe talk about some of those early symptoms. You mentioned brain fog. Those are, those are really precursors of later cognitive decline. And so the more that we take action 10 to 20 years before, you know, the big A, A Alzheimer's diagnosis or, you know, um, more severe memory loss, the better an impact you're going to have. Yeah, I think if people wait till they're symptomatic, their brain's already shrunk. Yes. And that's way too late for that to, yeah, we can't wait. We really, so my goal for my patients is to help them take steps. To they, um, I, I want them to know that they can improve their cognitive performance starting today if you take the right steps, and maybe we should start with food. So the right steps that can improve brain function, you're not just preventing memory loss. Our data from our clinic shows you can improve your brain's brain speed by 25%, being mentally sharper, quicker, less forgetful, and more productive. So how about we go to food, and let's, I'd love to hear your favorite foods for improving brain function. Well, you did the randomized trial, so I want to hear. I want to hear about your data. You know, off the top of my head, I would say it's it's the common foods that you know are good for you. You know, eating a lot of vegetables. I encourage people to have a pound of vegetables a day. The fiber will help you with the insulin resistance that you were just addressing that you think reverses sixty percent of cognitive decline. I would totally agree with that, and. Um, I think fats are really important. Healthy fats. You have a fantastic book on healthy fats. You know, especially the plant-based ones, um, you know, the coconut, the avocado, the olives, the sources of healthy fats. You know, the brain is, what, 60% fat? So we know the brain needs fat. That's a no-brainer. So I think, you know, along the same lines, if you look at some of the foods that I think are important to avoid, we know that sugar shrinks the hippocampus. You know, that part of the brain that's involved in memory consolidation and um, emotional regulation. We know that having a combination of high carbs, especially the refined carbs, together with more toxic fats is not a good combination for the brain. Um, gluten, you know, there's, there's not conclusive data, but there's definitely data, especially in celiac patients, that you can have adverse cognitive function as a result of eating gluten. And I think you can see this as well in people who have gluten sensitivity. So those are some of the common ones that I think about. What about you? What did you find in your trial? So we looked at things like adding, you said fiber for blood sugar control, but it's also, as you know, a really source of phytonutrients and plant pigments. And the more fiber we saw that people added to their eating plan, the better their processing speed. And there were some really powerful ones. Green leafies, I think, are like number one. And we, we actually, I read a study where if you looked at one cup of green leafies a day versus none, your brain was 11 years younger from just one cup. That's I mean, amazing. 
It is. And then beets and other colorful vegetables. We know beets increase the blood supply to the brain and they help with many aspects of brain and circulatory health. Um, berries and cherries, do, there's a myth they cause your blood sugar to go up, but you know, I don't really think not very much with a serving at all. And there and there's really good data on blocking the protein that forms with Alzheimer's disease, beta amyloid with more blueberries and other um, berries and cherries. Um, green tea, the data is really good for green tea. That I like matcha especially because of the theanine in it. But even a couple surprises for pigments that would have been controversy a few years ago, but coffee, um, one to two servings a day, not in excess, definitely not more than four. And likewise, red wine, one or two servings a day, in, especially in women. I mean, women seem to benefit more than men for both coffee, tea intake, and red wine intake. They had a moderate intake. Nobody benefited with excess. They actually got, as you imagine, they got worse. But so those things in moderation, I wouldn't have guessed that years ago, but I think the data has been kind of leaking that way. But those were the, and then you said fats. Well, I like smart fats, nuts. Every study we've looked at for nut intake is associated with better brain intake. Um, fatty fish like uh, wild salmon, that was a clear winner. Olive oil, I mean, the studies on olive oil have been really powerful for brain health and actually having one or two tablespoons of olive oil every day. My favorite um, cooking oil has probably become avocado oil because it's so heat stable. Yes. So sounds like we have a lot of overlap with the foods we'd like people to add, but those were my principal key oh and chocolate let me not forget <laughs> don't forget the chocolate. chocolate and cocoa I, I mean i almost missed that one but no i mean the the data is powerful both as a smart fat and um for those pigments and fibers so um all those foods if we eat them more often with the uh, coffee and alcohol clearly moderation um it's good for our brain and, and even people who had early early coffee improvements in the brain function when they added them. Amazing. So I, you know, I, I think we're going to agree on a lot of things today as we talk, but I'm going to push back on one of your suggestions just okay. because I'm hormone girl and you know how I like okay. to pay attention to estrogen. So yes. I know the data is, um, I think we're reevaluating some of the data on alcohol and I understand from okay. your randomized trial, you saw the benefits and, you know, believe me, I wish that in, in myself and in other patients that um, red wine, for instance, was good across the board, but definitely there is an association. So this is from observational data that women who drink more than two servings of alcohol per week have an increased risk of breast cancer. They have higher estrogen yes, levels true. and greater risk of estrogen. So, you know, sometimes you get into this situation where you're you're trying to benefit your brain, but it could be adversely affecting other parts of your body, like your breasts. So we have to make a judgment call about that. So what I tend okay. to do is I say, how about two glasses a week? Okay. <laughs> Five to seven ounces. Right, well, <laughs> For the women, fair, the men can have wine. All alcohol, two, yes, more than two servings a week of all alcohol clearly increase breast cancer risk. I'm totally with you. I think if you go back and look, and if you, I could even try to send you a study, that red wine, I did not see that with red wine. I saw it with all alcohol. I'm in total agreement. And actually, I said we saw no benefit for hard liquor, beer intake. White wine was questionable. So there, I can, there's no cognitive benefit to adding alcohol from hard liquor, beer, and white wine, maybe not. We only saw red wine as the benefit. But I thought my data from having spoken at these nutrition cancer conferences was that red wine in moderation, not more than one to two servings a day, didn't increase cancer risk. But I will have to look that up, and I promise I will send you something out of you. So I just want to throw that out there. So we'll follow up on this and maybe let we'll our people up. know. So it's... Um, I think in the in the JAMA study that was published, I believe in 2011, showing the increased risk of breast cancer, they were looking at all types of alcohol, but the majority of women in that study were drinking wine. I don't know if it was white wine versus red wine. I don't think they separated it out. So I, I, I'm not sure that it's been answered conclusively, okay. but we'll take a look at the data. Okay, I'll share something. And then, 
Yeah, and it might be for average American women, too. I think the other really point on that, if you're folate deficient and you drink alcohol, it's a lot worse. Yes. So I would never want someone to be folate deficient and drink alcohol. It's not like drink your wine and pop your supplement. I don't mean that. I'm just talking about a glass of wine with dinner. But that for the average woman who is folate deficient, especially if they take a bad quality multivitamin with just folic acid and they can't convert it, I think that's a much bigger problem than the population that you and I would recommend. They're nutrient repleted. Um, it might have less effect. But I, I cannot. I would never, never dispute that there might be some cancer risk with alcohol. I think the well, jury may be out on that one and you may turn out to be completely right. Well, it's, you know, I'm always, I'm always open to changing my mind. I think that's, that's the beauty of science is that it changes constantly. Believe me, I love a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon. I would love to be wrong on this one. So bring it on. <laughs> okay. And um, there are people who shouldn't drink. I mean, I have to acknowledge that that they can't drink one glass. If they have one glass, there's going to be the whole bottle. And click, I mean, just stop. <laughs> yeah. And if you can't limit yourself to one, not more than two a day, then um, absolutely don't have any. That's, I, and I always got to throw in that caveat because for some people um, it's good in theory, but it doesn't really work for them. Well, it's addictive for at least 10% of the population and maybe yeah. more, um, you know, the, Female alcoholics are a pretty fast-growing group. So, yes, you're right about that. Thank you for sharing that. So, how about nutrients? Well, I mentioned folate. I'm, I'm guessing you're on there with me. What are, the, what are some of your other key nutrients you would like people to make sure they're getting for brain health? Which ones come to mind, especially for you? Well, there's a lot of them. You know, the ones that come to mind first are kind of the basic building blocks that help with making neurotransmitters, things like magnesium, you know, getting your B vitamins. And I imagine you see this in your patients as well. My patients tend to be so deficient, both in magnesium and also in the B vitamins, especially B6, yes. B12. Um, you mentioned folate. So I see this so commonly. And I, I you know, it's, I, I would put vitamin D in this camp too, you know, that we have a lot of awareness now that there's certain nutrients that are so important for the brain as well as the rest of the body. And yet it's not common practice for people to keep taking the vitamin D that they have in their cupboard or to keep taking their magnesium and help, help them sleep at night and to take their B vitamins in the morning to, you know, kind of have that energy and that full, um, you know, kind of fill the shelves with the B vitamins that we need for making new neurotransmitters. So those are some of the nutrients that come to mind. I mean, there's some other herbs as well that I think really help with cognitive function, but what do you want to add to this list? You just hit my top four from our published data. Oh, good. Magnesium. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting quizzed. <laughs> it's fun. Magnesium, mixed folates, B12, and vitamin D. Those are our top four. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, good. That's I passed that well, one. <laughs> we are, yeah, like my, I, I always appreciated the research you put into reading about stuff and looking into the details and reading the studies. And yeah, that's very consistent with out there. I might, I would add fish, I would add long chain omega threes because our brain is almost 40%. So um, for the vegetarians, um, not to fear, you don't have to eat fish. You can get like DHA. Um, seaweed supplements, really common and easy to find out there. It's just made from algae. It's really super clean, probably cleaner than fish oil. But and if you do get fish oil, it's got to be good. I mean, that's the one thing of all the quality issues. There's plenty of quality issues in supplements um, with magnesium included. But especially if you're going to take fish oil, um, you have to be really cautious about the quality of that. Now, Stephen, what about... Um with magnesium, do you have a favorite magnesium salt? You know, some people tend toward magnesium glycinate because they feel like there's less of a gastrointestinal effect, you know, less loose stool. Other people are fans of magnesium three and eight. And I actually found that um, it was mostly animal data that that was based on. But 
you did the randomized trial. Okay. I've just well, read the studies. Our randomized data only looked at magnesium. I couldn't break it down, okay. honestly, because some people are on like a tarot, you know, not the best quality magnesium oxide, which to me is a yeah. GI irritant. Yeah. Magnesium glycinates my most common, you know, a chelated protein bound magnesium. That's the one I use most often. Um, but the three and eight, there was one study that looked at mild cognitive impairment, people with that, and they gave them, it sounded like a huge dose of magnesium. It was like 1,400 milligrams, two to three times a day, but it's mostly the three and eight protein. The magnesium was really, it wasn't that big a dose in it. Um, and they did show that they had an improvement in their cognitive score. So there's one, you know, isolated study sponsored by the manufacturer of course of course that showed real benefit and that's really the only one i know of but um and yeah. there's tons of marketing on that product because of that one's i definitely myself so it's actually quite a bit more expensive and the magnesium glycine as you pointed out is really easily tolerated and well absorbed yeah so i'm a little i have to admit i'm so my data only says magnesium i can't break it up Okay. Um, from our study and from our the thousand clinics go through our program and where we looked at cognitive function before and afterwards and tracked them. I, I don't I can't give you a, a specific type, but magnesium is like seventy percent of my patients are magnesium deficient. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, nationally, seventy to eighty percent of people are magnesium deficient. So that's that's one of those low hanging fruits that I want everyone who's like watching this yeah. right now to go out and get. So, and you can't really get it in a multi. You can get your vitamin D in a good multi. You can get your mixed folates and B12 and even some chromium to help so you're not chromium deficient and impact your blood sugar. But um, I, magnesium is like one of those extra pills you got to take. Eat your source of wild seafood, um, algae, shellfish, fish, or take that supplement. The other thing I don't have data from my clinic on that supplement wise seems really intriguing and powerful is curcumin. I don't know what your thoughts are on using curcumin for um, cognitive function and for overall brain function. Yeah, I'm a big fan of curcumin. I think it's it's one of the most potent anti-inflammatories as we were talking about earlier in our conversation. I think neuroinflammation is kind of one of those early stage parts of this process, whether you're losing memory or, you know, there's some other cognitive deficit that you're noticing. So I'm a big fan of curcumin. Um, I can't speak specifically to the brain effects. I did look at the data, you know, especially with hormonal effects on estrogen and so forth. Um, but you might know the data on curcumin and brain function. I don't think there's any memory randomized trials, but I may be wrong. Well, I, there's one recent one out of Australia, somewhat small, that really showed a benefit. And they really focused on these new forms of curcumin that are mycelized. Yes. So up till that time, people were having GI distress, trying to take in enough curcumin to get there. But the only trial I've seen with mycelized, well, nicely absorbed curcumin did show an improvement, but that's only, again, I'm always cautious when I see one study show something. And so I would put it on my very hopeful list. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Whereas yeah. vitamin D and mixed folates and B12, you'd just be crazy and magnesium not to get those. But curcumin, any other on your hopeful list that you would have that you really like to recommend for people? Well, I'm doing, you know, I'm always doing a little experiment on my own, so I can speak anecdotally about um, <laughs> okay. uh, a supplement called Neurohacker. Have you heard of this supplement? Uh, no. Tell so me. It has a lot of different components to it, so it's hard to say what is so effective, okay. but I've been using it as I finished up my fourth book. And I was pretty impressed. I'm someone who has um, ADD. You know, I just have very little dopamine in my prefrontal cortex. And so the more dopamine I can make, the happier I am, the more I can focus and get projects done. And so uh, this neurohacker supplement is really interesting. I think one of the key um, components of it is Bakupa. So are you a fan of Bakupa? Well, I'm following that. I'm I'm interested in that, and I've certainly read stuff about it. And, and so, 
that's intriguing. And yeah, that's a, a, my hopeful list, but I don't have that. I don't have that experience with it. So yeah, um, I'm glad to hear you bring that up and mention it. I too have ADD. <laughs> I've had it since I was a kid. So, and um, no wonder we yeah, get along so, so well, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I feel like I'm having my fourth child. This, The Better Brain Solutions, my fourth book, too. So, yeah, I didn't know we had that parallel as well. So, yeah, sweet. That we, all these things we learn as we, you know, move forward in life. It's very true. Very true. Very true. Okay. So, maybe a little on, it shouldn't be just a little, but I, we have, I did want to stress and then get to some toxins. Sure. So, what... For stress management, I mean, you used to be, a, I think this is really cool, a yoga instructor, right? I mean, wasn't that part of your background? Oh, I still am. You know, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm i trained as a physician scientist, as you are, but I'm a yoga teacher. And I would say both are really important to kind of my worldview and the way I think about um, translating science for people. and you know, as a, as an aside, I would also say that things like yoga, meditation, food, love, those things change the brain more powerfully than any drug out there. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, I'm a huge fan of yoga. I know it's not for everyone, but, um, I think it really makes a huge difference. And there's data showing that it improves memory. It improves executive function. It improves cognitive function. There's so many things that it does, but I, you know, I, I've written a lot about stress and kind of the the problems of chronic stress. And I just want to make the point, which I'm I'm sure your listeners have heard you talk about before, that stress cuts off neurogenesis. So that whole idea of growth and repair that keeps happening um, as we get older and we want to keep happening, it gets blocked by chronic stress. So we want to unblock it. We want to make sure that we're kind of, you know, dancing with stress in a different way. And I have my favorite ways of doing that. I'm sure you have your favorite ways too. And you probably use many of them in your randomized trials. So maybe we could riff back and forth with our favorite ways of dealing with stress. Well, and so here's one of the newest tools that's come to me in my clinic is we're doing now heart math. Yes. On all our patients. Yes. Fabulous. And I don't have anything published. We haven't analyzed the data in this, but my anecdotal look from over the last two years, almost all our patients, when they come through our valves, we do cognitive testing and we're doing heart math. And there's this really strong relationship to can you be focused and pay attention and how well you're managing your stress. And those people who on heart math look all red, basically they're not in tune. <laughs> they're distracted, they're agitated, they have sympathetic drive, they can't focus very well. No. Yeah, I'm, so, a, I'm a big fan of heart math. I, I wrote a lot about it in my first book because it's been shown to lower cortisol. It's been shown to help reverse insulin resistance. It's so effective at creating that balance between the sympathetic nervous system, fight, flight, and the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. So we want to have the balance between the two. And, you know, I always thought that the brain kind of told the adrenals what to do, you know, like make more cortisol, be stressed out. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I really feel like the heart is actually more important here, that the brain listens to the heart. And so this idea of heart math where you create coherence and, and this sense of balance between the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic is so important. Now, I started with heart math many years ago. I still do it, but I also just do a quick check of heart rate variability pretty much every morning, in part to see kind of how I'm doing with my stress levels. I think my levels are a little high right now. I had a big speech last night and, you know, I'm like a little revved up. Um, but I measure my heart rate variability in part to get a sense of my recovery. So not just... Um, for planning my fitness that day, you know, like today, my heart rate variability was in the 70s. So I did a spin class. And that was a really good fit for my body. But I love those kind of feedback loops where you measure your heart rate variability. You know, um, I right after I submitted my book, my level was in the 40s, which is not so good. And I had to back off and have, you know, some easy days. 
So I love that kind of feedback. I think that's really important. Hmm, nice. Well, I'm really happy to hear you say that. So to that actually adds a lot of weight to what I've been thinking. So I really appreciate that. Good. And yeah, I'm trying to get more and more of my patients just as a universal practice, at least 10 minutes a day, just to get grounded, focused, coherent, make that connection. I used to always think also about the brain was telling the heart what to do. I'm just, I didn't realize this interview with the heart math like founder they were talking about the heart. Most of the in, the messaging is from the heart to the brain, and I I was like, wow. Yeah. I mean, so the heart really does with it, you know, with sympathetic tone and can wire our appetite centers and our fear centers and um, get us all agitated, and that's really <laughs> revealing. So it makes it show how important it is to keep our heart calm, so it doesn't agitate our brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's huge. And, you know, I didn't learn that in medical school. It sounds like you didn't learn that in medical school. Oh. And it's, you know, it's, it's heart math is a little bit different than sort of your standard meditation. You know, you get this information about the time between each beat of your heart, which is not, you know, a lot of people think it's like one second, but it's not. It's more like, you know, 0.9 seconds and then 1.01 seconds. We want variability between each heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And the more, you know, one of the things I do with heartbeat with, uh, with heart math pretty consistently is I imagine um, someone I love and that's part of my meditation. It's a way of kind of activating the field from the heart yeah. and it really makes such a difference. I think it, it starts to bring oxytocin into the equation and, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's a really important part of coherence. So it's not so much, you know, I think a lot of people get stuck with uh, stress, they feel like, oh, I've got to reduce stress, you know, I've got to like, you know, move to some rural location and like, get out of my crazy life. No, it's more our reactivity. It's kind of the, you know, the way that we deal with our environment that needs to be addressed. And that's really the purpose of yoga and meditation and heart math is to kind of, you know, take it, um, as we say in yoga, off the mat and into the world where you are taking it into your relationships, the way you deal with your loved ones, your friends, your community. And uh, that's really where I think the magic is. And I love, really like the way you said you tied into a spin class. You looked at that and then decided, I'm going to spin today. Because, I mean, my own anecdotal is when I have a nice workout. I don't overdo it. I just have a nice workout. Um, I'm much calmer, you know, so I'm getting rid of, I'm lowering my tension and I'm building up my heart and I sweat out some toxins too. Yeah. It's, it's like a, it's a threefer yeah. <laughs> for sure. Anything else on, on stress? stress? Yeah. Maybe I'll we'll say shift over and round, wrap, wrap up with, um, some talk on toxins. Yeah. One more thing. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with something called a Muse headband. I feel like we're we're getting a little nerdy and talking about gear with heart math and now with Muse. But are you familiar with the Muse? Have you played with that at all? Yeah, yeah. I haven't used it in my clinic. I was just at a conference and they were showing it to me. And so I've just got an introduction to it and thought it was kind of neat. But tell me about what, what's your experience? So it's very cool. It's this headband that you put on. I'm sorry, I don't have it here to demonstrate for you, but um, it works with your smartphone. And it's, it's a clinical grade EEG machine, which used to cost about $35,000. They got yeah. the technology to put it into this little headband and you basically, you know, kind of tap your phone after you put it on and activate it. And it guides you through a visualization. So I happen to like the Deepak uh, Chopra meditation where mm -hmm. you listen to ocean sounds. And as you're meditating, when you have, um, when you're in a very calm brain state, and that's the relaxed state where the neurogenesis happens, we want that. So when you're in that calm state, you're listening to ocean waves. And um, the volume of the ocean waves gets louder if you're getting distracted and quieter as you get calmer. And the longer that you sustain a calm brain, you start to hear birds chirping. So the cool thing about this, it's basically technology-assisted meditation, 
is that it gamifies meditation. So for someone who's competitive and low in dopamine like I am, it's a really good thing because I, you know, I want those birds. I want to hear the birds chirping. So I, I use a muse for 30 minutes every morning. I really love uh, the practice. And there's data showing that it's got multiple cognitive benefits, including memory improvement. There's a study from the University of Texas showing this in as little as 20 minutes for four days in a row. So it doesn't take long to start to reset the brain. I think that's kind of the coolest part of this whole conversation about the brain. Well, I'm really glad you shared that because um, I will have to pursue that more and look into it. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. I mean, mm -hmm. you can get pretty much everything on Amazon, but that's the easy thing to do. Yeah. So toxins. For, let me start with my clinic. The only one we were really able to track of all the really what we think of as toxins is mercury. Yes. And the more big mouth fit, we actually track between like wild, you know, small mouth fish like salmon or trout or sole. And we track for big mouth fish like do you eat more tuna, grouper, snapper, swordfish, bass, or shark? And if they said yes, they ate it more than two, three times a week, that predicted a high mercury level. And if their mercury level, normal is 11, but if it was more than 15, they had a drop in, in brain function and brain speed. If it was more than 20, it had a significant drop. And I'm prone to this too. I mean, I do eat seafood and I... My mercury, I have to, I'm constantly working on this. I take supplements to help detoxify and remove mercury. So we we clearly showed that from our clinic data that mercury was associated with decreased processing speed and decreased verbal memory. So Yeah, that's that makes total sense. I think mercury is really the um one of the leading villains when it comes to the brain. I mean there's there's certainly others in the heavy metal camp, like arsenic and lead, Flint, Michigan is a good example of, you know, or, the most yeah, recent crisis. Community. And a lot of people are contaminated in their water. I had a patient who was so careful about her food, but she put rice milk in her coffee every morning. And a lot of rice milk is really high in arsenic. So, mm -hmm. you know, it can be kind of these surprising things. She thought she was being so good staying off of dairy right. and gluten. But That's the sad point, isn't it, right? She thought totally. she was being good and got tricked. Right. So, um, you know, I'm, I like talking about hormones and endocrine disruptors, what they do in the brain. So certainly bisphenol A is such an important one. Okay. Um, and the way that it affects the, the uh, control center for the brain, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Phthalates also can disrupt um, hormone activity starting in the brain. It's been tracked pretty carefully to be associated with a change in the time of puberty in boys. Bisphenol A has been associated with um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, well, it's been associated with pretty much every disease that you want to look up um, from, including brain diseases, right? Like all, like uh, autism and ADD, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So those are some toxins I think about. Fluoride, I think, is another really common one. Um, a lot of people don't realize that fluoride in the water can be toxic if they're sensitive. I happen to be, um, I'm missing the gene that helps me process mercury. So it sounds like you may have some issues too. I don't know if you did any genetic testing in your randomized trial, but um, I did, we didn't. Not not that we controlled for it. I haven't even done it for myself. So maybe off another time. I'll have to get that tidbit from you. We'll have to we'll have to run your panel. But that's an important one, you know, because I think when it comes to the brain, realizing that, you know, if you're like me and you have a problem with some of your detox genes, mm -hmm. and maybe your DNA repair genes, it means that it can have a big impact. And so I'm more sensitive to toxins like mercury than someone who's got a normal gene. So I really have to stay on it. I test my mercury twice a year. Um, I'm really careful about the fish that I eat. I mean, I'm, I'm from Alaska, so I eat a lot of um, freshly caught uh, salmon from Alaska. But, you know, it's, there's, there's other ways that you can get exposed to these toxins. You know, I, I had a lipstick that contained lead and my lead level was high. Wow. So there's lots of ways that we can get exposed. I now have organic lipstick on and <laughs> no lead. 
Well, and I'm glad you brought up the BPA and phthalates because those also in small amounts per week increase your blood sugar levels and increase your risk for diabetes and huge. Um, so again, insulin resistance being the number one preventable cause for memory loss right there, you know, BPA free cans, uh, get rid of the cooking with plastic and less plastic bottles. And we could cut those two. I'm really glad you brought those out. How about, I'm curious. So we don't have this data from our clinic. It would be very hard to track. But I've been reading up quite a bit on the work on nitrosamines. You know, they put in sandwich meats and bologna and processed meats and bacon. And for years, you know, I've known they increased your cancer risk. That's been pretty obvious. Yes. But the recent data, they gave like nitrosamines in just a small dose to rodents. And they got insulin resistance and they're neurotoxic. And they immediately ended up with cognitive decline. And the more they gave them, they got Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Okay. I'm writing this down because I, I don't know the new data. I mean, I, I always tell my patients to stay away from processed meats because they disrupt the astrobilome. So that, you know, that part of your microbiota in your gut that, um, that too. in their DNA. <laughs> so it's, and it changes your estrogen levels. So I, I tell people to stay away from processed meats for that reason, but this is a new one. You know, we, as we were talking about bisphenol A and phthalates, I wanted to also clarify, as you said, they can be associated with insulin resistance. They're obesogens. They are basically toxins that make you fat through the insulin resistance process. And it sounds like nitrosamines might be in that camp too. So, yeah, if you do nitrosamine and look up our Dr. Susan De La Monte, you know, she's the woman who came up with this type 3 diabetes term. Yes. You'll, you'll pop up on several articles that I'm sure will be of interest to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the tip. So, yeah, nitrosamines was one. And then there was another one from I got from Dr. Brewer from the American College of Nutrition. He's been, you know, talking about for years. But I was always having trouble with that because we've always gotten copper from food and nuts and seeds. But he, he clarified it in a way for me that made it really simple. There's organic copper that we get from eating nuts, beads, seeds, green leafies, totally benign. And there's inorganic copper that we can get from cheap supplements when they add like copper sulfate. Or we use copper sulfate as a pesticide to kill bugs. Or we can get it from our plumbing now. I, you know, if we're not careful, we get inorganic copper. We have acidic water. You mentioned Flint, Michigan. The acidic water pulls the copper out of the plumbing and puts it in our water, and that's inorganic. And inorganic copper is a really strongly related to Alzheimer's rates and memory decline. So I've been recommending that if you take a supplement, it's got to have no copper or organic copper, but I'm sure all the good brands you would recommend, like I do, are organic copper. But reverse osmosis for your kitchen, for if you happen to have – copper plumbing at home and there's nothing wrong with that you just have to have a process to deal with it like reverse osmosis which cuts a whole bunch of stuff out of our city water right so that we probably right. don't want so including and I don't, fluoride I don't showering it's just for drinking and cooking yeah what do you think? including fluoride you know a lot of the the carbon filters don't get fluoride so reverse osmosis will help you with the copper as well as the fluoride any other toxins that popped? I mean, those, that's been a great list you brought up. Did you have anything else? Well, those are the main ones. I mean, I, I think about, um, I mean, the, the list is pretty long, right? There was a really great Atlantic article where they, they talked more for the lay reader about the 12 most common brain toxins. And there's things like chlorophos, you know, the mm -hmm. some of the pesticides and other um perchlorate. Uh, I'm not as, I, I have to admit that I don't know the data inside and out on some of the other toxins that are not part of, you know, kind of my bread and butter, the ones that affect, you know, like bisphenol A, it disrupts so many different hormones, estrogen, testosterone, thyroid, insulin. Yes. So I, I feel like BPA is sort of the devil that I know. <laughs> and I, I still am getting to know these other devils, but those are those are the main ones. I would put chronic stress in the uh -huh. toxin category. I would yeah, also maybe put, um, uh, you know, having a hormonal desert 
very low hormone levels. There's some people who just don't do well with brain function. They can't do memory encoding yeah. well if they don't have enough estrogen in their brains. So those aren't so much toxins, but, you know, kind of it's along a spectrum. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned pesticides because I think that was the last one I really wrote a section on in my book. And I'm not, I'm not as, I am by no means an expert on all the various ones. But when they looked at or pesticide content in people, if you had high level of pesticides versus low in your tissue, your risk for Alzheimer's is 350% higher. Huge. So, oh, I, need to, I need that study too. Percent. That's a lot. That's huge. And I, you know, so, I'll say one quick hopeful thing because I think... You know, what happens with a lot of people when they start to hear about toxins is they just think, I'm doomed. I might as well, you know, go have a bottle of wine. Like, <laughs> I know I'm getting exposed every day. So there was a study from a place, I think, in New Zealand, where they took a group of people who went to this retreat. So it was like a yoga plant-based food retreat where they added some eggs and fish. And they measured their pesticide level at the beginning of the retreat and at the end of the retreat. They also measured 37 health factors. Every single health factor got better when people did one week of plant-based food, plus some of these foods you've mentioned, like fish and eggs, and they dropped their pesticide level significantly yeah. inside of one week. So I think or eating organic food really makes a difference mm -hmm. when it comes to pesticides and kind of the body burden of that. Well, and something you've really been good at teaching for years is, you know, detox once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Once, yes, we want to cut out the, you know, farm produced, these animals from feedlots where they're given hormones. We want to eat, if we're eating fruit and vegetables, watch out for the dirty dozen. But go out and detox. For, I, I love when I get your, I get your email. So I see when you've got your detox going on, I'm always thinking, oh, that's great. But I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> well, it makes sense. It, you know, I used to think of detox as a luxury and mm -hmm. it's not a luxury anymore. It's really yeah. a necessity. It's an imperative. So I, you know, it's inevitable that we retox after we detox. Um, but I, I think periodically you want to get very intentional about cleaning out your body. So thank you for that. Well, congratulations on your fourth book. And same I, to I, you. Gonna, got that in. And I'm going to just pull it up and show you. Here's the title for my new fourth Beautiful. book. Beautiful. Better Brain Solution. I, I, I really love it, the cover they came out with. So It's gorgeous. It's soothing. It looks a little like heart math. You know, like I'm in coherence looking at the cover of your yes. book. <laughs> Like there's this spiral thing going on in my brain when I look at the book. So I yeah. like it. So thank you very much for this conversation. I always enjoy talking with you, but this today was especially fun. Well, it's so fun to talk to you, Stephen. And, you know, our brains are getting older. We need each other. <laughs> we need to be like reading the literature, maybe coming up with the same opinion, maybe slightly different opinions and then talking about it. It helps mm -hmm. us. It helps our people. We need to like spread it far and wide. <laughs> Well, thank you for your time, Sarah. You, you're always terrific to talk with, and good luck in everything you're doing. And I'll look forward to seeing everybody next time. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everybody.